Hi, um, I'm Tracy Francis. I'm the festival director for the Cascade African Film Festival, and I am here with Manel Labidi, the director of tonight's movie, Arab Blues. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Where are you joining us from tonight? Uh, well, now I'm in the southwest of France. Um, uh, it's a city close to Bordeaux. I am on holidays with my with my kids. <laughs> oh, that's fun. Yeah. I know Bordeaux for their wine there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's famous for, for that, but uh, the, um, the, the city I am uh, exactly is uh, maybe one hour from Bordeaux. It's by, uh, by the ocean. It's very, very quiet and it's uh, the first vacation since, uh, uh, I mean, a long time because in France, you know, I mean, as uh, most of people are here, I mean, you know, we've been facing the lockdown and we had a lot of limitations regarding traveling. So, I mean, we had this opportunity to, uh, to change a bit, you know, our state of mind. So we decided to, to, to come here for, for a week. That's nice. It's good to change your state of mind in these yes. this year, especially. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'd love to start just talking a little bit about just kind of your journey into filmmaking, because you have kind of an unusual career path, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's pretty unusual. I mean, I guess it's less, um, uh, I guess in the US, you guys have um, more, um, I mean, you, you, you have more changes in terms of careers. I mean, something that is more common, I guess, in your culture than it is in France. Um, but um, before um, uh, making films, I, uh, I used to, to work in, uh, in the finance industry. Actually, I studied politics and economics. And um, when I turned 23, I finished my studies and uh, you know, I had to, you know, to, to pay back my loan and things like that. So I, you know, I went, you know, into a pretty convenient career path, even if I always dreamed about being a filmmaker. But I guess um, the, um, the context I grew up in and uh, uh, my family background, I mean, everything was very, was so far actually from, from this world that I never authorized myself to, to think about this, um, this, uh, this, this career. I mean, something that was too far from me, it was just a dream. And um, I had a more, let's say, um, rational way of seeing my life. And um, so I, I worked there for a couple of years, I pay back my loan and, you know, I got this kind of feeling of security and um, when I turned 29, I, I had this crisis, like it's, it, it looked like a middle-age crisis, but it was a bit, you know, earlier. And uh, I knew that I, I couldn't spend my life, you know, having this, um, even if it was interesting, um, it was not me, you know. I, I was doing this thing well, but uh, uh, there is no spark, there is no meaning for me so um, I decided to um, to quit and to start from scratch because uh, obviously I didn't do a film school but I was let's say uh, a self-learner uh, I, I was uh, uh, I mean I, I've been watching movies uh, all my life I, I'm a huge reader and I always I mean even during my holidays in my spare time I would I would write a lot uh, but for myself, once again, I've never, you know, thought that someone would read that some someday. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, once I I got the feeling that nothing really bad could happen to me, you know, I mean, worst case scenario that I wouldn't make any film and probably I would have to apply for, let's say, a regular job. Once I knew that, I said, okay, if you don't quit, if you don't try, uh, you will re you will live with regrets. And I guess that's for me the worst thing that you know can happen to someone that you know just wishing he he or she could have you know just uh, made this step. So I quit everything and uh, and I started to um, spend all my days uh, in um, a cinema library in Paris. Uh, I would watch movie, trying to um, 
to see how they were made, how they were written, how they were directed. It was very something that I, I did on my own, you know, because I didn't know anyone, I didn't have any, you know, network or anyone who could just, you know, uh, take me on board with him or her. So uh, I was very lonely for a few years, uh, but I was writing a lot. And then I applied um, to a program that is uh, a program that is, um, uh, you know, uh, created, that was created by La Femis, which is a national film school in, in France. Uh, so I applied there, I took um, several exams and uh, interviews, and, um, and so I got in, and uh, I had this opportunity to um, present Arab Blues uh, in this program, and uh, I wrote it actually during this program, during this year. And after this, uh, and I was also writing a short film that I was, you know, planning to shoot uh, very, I mean, uh, before anything happened with Arab Blues. And uh, after this year, during um, the final jury, uh, there were different producers and one of them got really interested uh, in this project. So, so we met and we talked and I, you know, I, I saw that we had the same vision uh, that he was very respectful of the way I wanted to tell the story and uh, because it was a bit um, uh, tricky um, because of the theme, because of the, um, the genre. Um, a lot of people who read the project, you know, you know, try, try to uh, uh, convince me that I had to, um, uh, to play this um, cultural clash between Western world and, and the Arab world in a very, let's say, um, tacky way, you know, and I said, okay, I'd rather not do anything, you know, but you won't, you won't make me this kind of film. I want to do something different that I've never, you know, I rarely get the chance to see because the Arab issue in, in France and in Europe, I guess in the US also, but probably because of our colonial history is very, very touchy, very, um, it's very hard to deal with these kind of issues right now. I mean, of course, you can deal with them if you uh, use the drama, but in a comedy, people are very like scared and they'd rather go for a, let's say, very simple comedy that is not really, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, that it has doesn't have any political or uh, more, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, committed um, background. So when, when I found this producer, I knew that, uh, that he was the one that could, you know, help me to, uh, to make this film. So um, we, we finished the writing together. I mean, the script was almost done, more or less. And, um, and then we, he submitted the, the script to a national contest, you know, and I won that. And from that day, I mean, I got the interest from the distributors, from the, the TV channels, I mean, all the, uh, the guys that finance uh, French cinema. So uh, things got, you know, I mean, it went pretty quickly, you know, if you take the average, you know, uh, that it takes for someone uh, to make a film in France. I mean, I consider myself pretty lucky, especially, considering the fact that I didn't know, you know, anyone and I was coming from another, another, another world. Uh, it, I was pretty lucky, I mean, to have all these events, you know, combining together. And, and so I managed to shoot my film uh, just one year after leaving the school. And I, and I made my short film just, you know, just before. So it was like, this year I shot like two films and, uh, so it was um, it was great, really. It was a, it was a great experience, and and now I am actually still working with the same producer for my second feature film, and it's a great collaboration because it's uh, it was someone that trusted me, even if I was not like a someone that you know that had experiences, you know, in this uh, in directing. Even if I actually I before that I I worked in um, in the theater. I I set up a play and I. And I had an experience with, with comedians, with actors that uh, was basically my, my only uh, concrete, you know, experience. But other than that, I just, you know, wrote stuff for the radio. I wrote stuff for some TV project and things like that. But, uh, you know, it had 
nothing actually he could rely on. So he just trusted me and trusted my, uh, let's say my willingness, you know, to make this, uh, this film. I mean, that's, that's great that you, this is your first, you know, big film and it's gotten so much, um, you know, exposure and it's such a beautiful film and good for you for pushing against the pressure to do stereotypical Western clash films because we don't need those and also good for you for pushing comedy because I think comedy is such a great genre and such a great way to open people's hearts and minds to things and a lot of times people are like no 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 make the drama and I love that you <laughs> you did a comedy I love comedy so I am really grateful for you to do that um, and I know you I'm glad you didn't go to that kind of Western you know versus Arab stereotype stuff but you did just talk a lot about or bring a lot of things about just kind of that inner culture clash within within the character, right? Of living between two cultures and, you know, are you from there, are you from here? Where do you fit in? Um, and I know you you grew up in France mostly, correct? And so yeah, absolutely. Actually, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, this, um, the central theme of the, of the film, as you mentioned, is obviously identity and how, um, where do you belong to? Where's your anchor somehow? And as far as I'm concerned, I, I was born in France. Uh, my parents were, um, are still uh, Tunisian immigrants. They arrived in France uh, at the end of the 70s and I was born in, in 82, 1982. Um, and um, it's funny because at home, uh, we, we would speak Arabic all the time. We had like this pretty uh, well-established Tunisian culture uh, just in the middle of um, the Parisian suburb. Uh, and we would go to Tunis uh, every summer, uh, like for two or three months when I was, like, I mean, young until my twenties, basically, I would go there every year and I would spend like two or three months. Um, so, uh, and at the same time, I, I went to the French school. I had a French education also. Uh, I learned French at school and had like, another French culture outside my home. And um, it's funny because I guess it's, I discussed this with a lot of um, um, this um, generation of immigrants who, who said that, you know, when you're young, it's, it's a huge conflict that you are like torn between two cultures, especially two cultures that are uh, different uh, in terms of uh, traditions, in terms of religion, in terms of everything. Um, and when you're young, you, you believe that it's a curse, you know, that you're not going to make it. It's, uh, it's too hard and you have to choose and, it's, and, and you try to fit in both. And it's, it's very hard. And when, when I start, I mean, getting some maturity and having, uh, and, and when I stopped, you know, uh, you know, waiting for other people validation, you know, it just, you know, it just, um, for me, it was just the, the biggest um, asset I had, you know, and instead of just thinking about, okay, how I'm going to uh, fit in or, or where, where is my camp, I just, okay, I just need like to, to build my third, uh, third voice, you know, I'm going to take this and this and maybe other aspects from, uh, I love, for instance, um, England, uh, Great Britain and America in terms of culture. Um, there's so many things that, you know, inspire me a lot from the Anglo-Saxon world. And I know that today, um, as a woman, as, as an artist, I'm a mix of, of course, my, my Arab uh, background, my French education, but also all my inspirations coming from the Anglo-Saxon world. And, um, and now today, I'm not trying to fight against that. I'm just trying to... Uh, uh, to build and to create something that, you know, uh, belong to me and that is the result of all this history. And, uh, and this film actually was a way for me to, um, uh, to repair and, and make peace, you know, with this, um, uh, this turmoil. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, making this film in Tunis was basically uh, the story of this film. It's, it was seen as crazy as the character who wants to, to set up a practice. A lot of people said, okay, why, why don't you make your film in France? Things will be so much easier. And, uh, but I knew that I couldn't do any other films if I don't do this one first. 
I can't even tell you why in a rational way. It's, it was like a calling, you know. I needed like to, uh, to tell about uh, my heritage. I needed to, to tell about how hard it is to, um, to, to be French and to, to, to live in France. And that's why there is no scenes that takes place in Paris or in France. It's something that I really wanted to be, um, you know, behind the character that we don't see. And it was something that I made on purpose. And, um, and also it was important for me to, um, to make a film and to work in Tunis, to make people work for me because my parents left Tunis because they couldn't work, you know? And I guess this is for me a, a way to repair something like uh, the, the, they left because there were no opportunities for them. And I guess making this film there and being empowered to, to do something there uh, without their help was a way for me to just, you know, to, to end this, this story, this family story, and to begin, you know, something new. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, and thinking about that, the main character, Salma, um, so I know she, she doesn't really speak Arabic, I noticed uh, ever during the film, maybe a couple words here and there. And was that a character choice or is that, was that because of the actress who was Iranian? <laughs> Well, you know, it was a at the beginning because uh, the actress uh, could have, I mean, spoke a lot more because she uh, she has this uh, ability, I mean, to, uh, uh, to, to learn a language phonetically. Mm -hmm. So we, we could have, I mean, uh, work like that. But I just tried actually to, um, to base this um, according to my experience, because it's funny um, for me, I mean, I, I speak Arabic, I speak the Tunisian dialect to be, to be specific. Um, but when I go there to Tunis, it's funny because how um, language, I mean, change completely. It's, um, for me, it's more comfortable to, to speak in French because I feel more uh, empowered because the, the Arabic I, I know is a family. Arabic, you know, I don't know any bad words. I couldn't like, you know, uh, swear. I couldn't like, you know, defend myself. If someone would insult me, I couldn't like, you know, speak back, you know, I don't know any, any words, you know, like that because I didn't I go to high school. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't hang out with young people. I just hang out with my family. And, you know, we can like, I can talk to you about like uh, food and, and the market and things like that for hours. But I couldn't tell you anything about sexuality in Arabic. It's, it's funny how uh, the language and the way we are taught the language, you know, make some borders, you know, and, uh, and it tells a lot. So for me, it was important that she would understand everything, but to, to gain this confidence, um, and, and plus in Tunis, basically people, I mean, most of the people understand French and, and, and the way people interact they mix actually both languages. Um, people just can talk sometimes. I, I talk in French, sometimes I talk in, in Arabic and they would reply in French and they would reply in Arabic. I mean, there is this mix and this musicality of these two languages um, uh, living together, like the Arabic and the, the, the language of the former colonizer. Um, I, I've always been fascinated by this music when I would go to Tunis because, um, in terms of rhythm, in terms of sonority, it's very disturbing for someone who is not used to it, you know? You have someone talking in Arabic for two minutes and all of a sudden he would like put like three sentences in French and go back to Arabic. And you have all these combinations um, that for me was interesting actually to, to play with. And, um, and also it's because it's uh, probably the music of um, uh, the image or the, um, that I have of this country, of, the, of this culture. Because at home, we would speak French and Arabic all the time. We would speak French to my mother and she would reply in Arabic. When I go there with my family, it would be the same. And, um, and this film is also a, um, a tribute or an homage to, uh, to, to this, all the summers that I spent there um, with my aunts, my uncles, this neighborhood that is actually the, we shot actually in this, in the neighborhood I, I, I grew up 
uh, in actually the, the house we shot, the main house was um, situated five, min five minutes away from my grandfather's house. So it was exactly, I mean, the colors, the smells, the people, the, the houses, I mean, everything was so um, similar to what I had in mind, what I uh, pictured while I was writing the script that I needed also to recreate the music and the music was um, half French, half Arabic and, uh, and there is no, let's say, rationality. It's, it's a chaos, you know, you can't understand why this, this guy would reply in French or this one would start uh, her, his sentence in, in Arabic. It's, it's like, a, it's a chaos, yeah. And <clears throat> say, speaking of the music, the music was such almost like a character in the film too, just coming in just the right moments to kind of carry us through and like, you know, change the mood of the scene. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process for um, selecting the music and also selecting where the music came in, in the film? Well, that was a very interesting uh, work to do actually, because um, the, the only thing that I, I was sure about regarding the music is that um, I wanted to open the film and close the film with these songs from this Italian singer called Mina, because, um, you know, in Tunisia, uh, the Italian culture is very present and very popular. Um, when, I, when I was younger, uh, when I would go there, I mean, the, the two channels that we had, TV channels we had in Tunis, was the French uh, national uh, channel and the Italian one, the Rai, that I even know. And um, I know that a lot of uh, Tunisian are, uh, of course, there, there were some French singer, singers that were very popular, but the Italian, the popular uh, Italian music was huge there. And um, once again, in, in my souvenirs, I mean, uh, this music was, um, played at home, at my grandmother's, uh, in different cafes, restaurants. I mean, it was huge there. And also, uh, it was a way for me to, um, to remind that this film is not only Arab, but it's, it's French, but it's also Mediterranean, you know, and, it's, and Italy is actually, for me, a mix of France and Tunisia. Uh, in Italy, I mean, it's a Western, of course, culture, but uh, the way people interact with their families, the way they speak, their physicality, uh, their energy, their hysteria is very close actually to, to Tunis. And when I was young, I remember I would watch Italian comedies from the 70s, the one from uh, Dino Risi, Monicelli and, and guys like that. Or even I remember one of the shock was um, Amarcord from Fellini. I was so... Uh, amazed how uh, similar Italian and Italian culture was uh, similar to Tunisian to the Tunisian one. And um, I know that over the past years, media tried to, um, uh, to put the Arabs in the same bag saying, okay, these guys are like you know, one category. And a lot of people forgot the heritage and the history we shared, you know? And for me, it was very important to make this movie uh, um, also a movie about the, the region of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, you know, it's very important because in the south of France, you have Marseille, uh, cities like that, you have in Italy, Napoli and the city of the south, you have Tunis, and when you look at these cities, a lot of people who would go there would, wouldn't tell the difference, the architecture, the energy, the, the weather, the people, um, we are basically the same, you know, and, uh, and, and putting this Italian song at the beginning, at the end was also a way for me to make it universal, you know, it's not some exotic film that, you know, takes place in a small um, uh, town in Tunis, it's something that is, let's say, bigger, you know, and a lot of people can totally relate to the characters and, and to this melancholia that actually go through uh, the whole film uh, without being Tunisian, you know, and I was very surprised by the feedback that I got from French, from Italian, but also from people coming from Egypt, from Turkey, from Iran, from South America, and, and you see that it's, um, it's not uh, just a, an Arab story, it's something that is more universal, and um, so yeah, so the music was like, 
I just made a point on, on these two uh, songs that open and, and close the film. But within the movie, the score that we created with um, the, the musician that I worked with called Fleming Nortrop, who is actually from Norwich, so another culture. Um, it, was, uh, it, it was very interesting because at the beginning we, we, we tried actually to, um, uh, to, to go for a score that would um, emphasize not the comedy, but more the, the, the drama that is actually, you know, uh, told uh, in, the, in the subtext of the film. And, um, and it was very important actually to, uh, to use the instruments that were present in this um, Italian variety, popular song from the 70s, from the 60s, uh, like the trumpet, uh, that, was very, that, that was very, very strong instrument we used. And, and trying actually just to, um, uh, to put it in a, not in a way to um, emphasize a situation, but just to bring a situation a bit uh, further. Um, it was very important for us, I mean, that the music would not underline any feelings or, or situation, but just create like a, a twist, you know, uh, it's um, because using the music in, in film is very tricky and sometimes it, it can be an easy way just to fill in blank or you don't get the emotion from the actor so just put some music and it was not actually our, uh, our intention. We wanted actually to surprise uh, with a score that um, is not an oriental one because I mean there was no for me uh, rationale to use one because it's uh, it's not because we are in Tunis that we need to use uh, oriental music unless it's organic to the scene, like the scene of the, the, the wedding. Uh, but other than that, uh, we wanted to make, a, to create a music that uh, would be coherent with, um, with um, the overall feeling of the, of the movie, which is for me, the, the main feeling that for me is um, uh, in this movie is the melancholia. And uh, so that's why we, we, we decided to, uh, to go to, into this direction. I remember one specific moment that I really loved was the moment of the breath test and that tension you were building and then the music comes in at just the right moment to kind of carry us through that and carry us out of it. And it's such a, it was such a specific and lovely use of it. And I was just really impressed with, with that. Um, and to talk, I know this is, we're talking now about such a universal story, but I'd love to also talk about how it is specific to doing this and thinking about, you know, I know everything's revolution, revolution, post-revolution, but I think that's inevitable too, because that is part of, you know, that's part of the culture now and that's part of what people are going through since 2011. And how do you think this film kind of reflects the shifts in, in psyche, not psyche, see what I did there? <laughs> um, shifts in personality and shifts in culture since the revolution. Well, you know, it's, um, it's, I mean, I, I was very, very su surprised, but I mean, with the distance, I mean, I'm no longer surprised, but at that time, um, I was struck by the fact that um, uh, people got all of a sudden talkative. I mean, they used to talk a lot, you know, culturally, we talk a lot, but um, they would talk during the dictatorship, they would talk about like daily life, like very ordinary things, like uh, um, like the food shopping, schools for kids, and things like that. But people had a very hard time talking first about politics because it was forbidden, but also about the intimacy. And after the revolution, uh, it felt that uh, people just got. Um, um, I mean, it's like an explosion, basically, a blow up, you know. And when you would go, for instance, to, to get some bread, you know, you would spend an hour because the baker would just like talk to you nonstop. It, it's, it felt like, you know, people were just like um, so um, trapped, you know, in their, uh, in their intimacy, in their political opinion, they could not even express them because they were afraid, afraid of, you know, being arrested, being afraid, uh, afraid of what the other would say about them. 
but with a revolution, um, it's just like something completely disappeared. And um, but you know the, the way the, the people would talk was not um, organized. They would talk a lot and uh, about everything. They, it was not organized or, or canalized. And that's how I, I thought about this idea because I said, okay, the, the revolution that the country is going through is just the sum of all the individual revolution that people are actually experiencing. And um, this is what happened on different levels, on a different um, aspect. I mean, people uh, got, uh, let's say, suddenly religious all of a sudden because for decades, religion was not really uh, well perceived by the dictator because of the fear of Islamism. Uh, but some people got completely the other way around, the opposite. And uh, you had this huge artistic scene that, you know, emerged after the revolution. Um, I mean, people for, let's say, uh, a few months or maybe one year uh, got the, um, the possibility to, to be or to try to become what they want to be. Uh, but of course, this was for me a um, uh, hope, but in the reality, things are more complicated because uh, in terms of um, politics, um, it's still, I mean, a mess, even if we got elections, even if democracy is uh, it's trying to, to be, and is working somehow, but um, the people who are ruling the country in, are you know questioned all the time there is there are no results the crisis is you know it's getting worse and worse and um people some people even sometimes can regret you know the um, the past because they had so much hope and now the, the perspectives for their kids for them are are rare uh and um so, but what, what the revolution brought for sure is that um, people now are not afraid to talk. And that is something that is completely, that was completely new. And if that's the only thing that, you know, that uh, can be seen as a positive, I guess it's already, you know, uh, a great step. But um, unfortunately, um, the, the hope um, that uh, we all had after the events faded away pretty, pretty rapidly, you know. And, um, but, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm still very optimistic because, I mean, the, the young generation um, that was the engine of this re revolution is still very, careful and very um, protective of what they managed to, uh, to get during this re revolution. So I'm not worried about the fact that um, uh, Tunisia will, I don't know, get into a harsh dictatorship soon. I'm, I'm not really worried about that. Uh, the only thing I'm, I'm worried is that uh, the country is is, is so divided, but the division is actually the result of that. And um, we can't really regret the fact that, uh, sorry, it's like, Hold on one second, sorry. Je l'ai pas là, je suis désolée. Sorry. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, the, the division um, that we see in the, um, in the country is probably the result of this uh, freedom, you know, of, um, uh, that, 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 that we gained, you know, and, uh, and, and probably it's the, the price to pay if you want to tend, you know, to, uh, for a democracy, it's probably the price to pay uh, is to yeah to to be ready to see a country with so much division with people not you know people who don't agree who are fighting in the 
uh, in the chambers, in, on TV, on, during political debates. And it's probably the, the transition, the, the necessary transition, you know, for a, let's say, more um, pacified uh, political landscape. Um, and let me know if you have to go take care of things or anything. Is to fine. So she was looking for like something for her hair, but it's okay. not, not urgent. <laughs> okay. All right. um, I'd love to talk about just a couple of the characters that really struck me. Um, one of them is Ulfa, um, the young woman, and it just also the representation of LGBTQ characters in your film, which is just rare to see in Arab film, but also rare to see in just in a way that's not over dramatized or, you know, it's made to seem very normal and lovely in your film um, in the culture. And I'd love if you could talk about your inclusion of those characters. Yeah, I mean, these characters are actually characters that are not, uh, that, that, that you can see, I mean, very usually there. And, um, and of course, as you said, usually we dramatized um, uh, these characters because of the, um, the context because the, the taboo regarding uh, homosexuality, uh, about um, uh, trans, uh, trans people, I mean, there is a taboo for sure. But also what I noticed is that um, there is this, um, how do you say, it's like people, you know, they don't want to talk about it, but they accept it somehow. And I remember gr growing up um, when I was a young girl, I would go to Tunis and um, the, the hairdresser that would cut my grandfather's hair and that would cut all the family's hair was a trans. He would dress as a woman, he would wear makeup. And I remember I would go there and say, guys, don't you say anything? I mean, no. And people say, oh, come on, he's funny. He likes to, you know, to, you know, to put clothes on him. I mean, it's like, you know, there is this denial, but it's not really denial. It's a way, I guess for me, this is how I see it. It's a way to protect a certain social peace. It's a way to show a certain um, tolerance, but still they're not ready actually to, um, to talk about it in a, let's say, serious way. But the first step that I noticed is that a lot of people are actually completely integrated in the community and people know about their life, but they don't really ask questions because of the, let's say, the, the social control that is still very strong in this culture. Um, but um, the stereotype that would you know, tell you as a screenwriter to say, okay, this guy is gay, so he's going to be like beaten up by the neighborhood. No, it's not really like that. There is actually um, a gray zone where people that are not, you know, in the, in the norm, in the social norm, can still be part of the community uh, and, um, and be accepted somehow. It's, it's, it's very strange, but, this is why I, what I, I witnessed in my family. I my cousin, one of my cousins, is probably gay. I, I would, yeah, I know that for sure, but because I know, but we don't talk about it. But everybody knows, and nobody re, don't really say anything. He is still, you know, part of the family. He's still invited. You know, we see each other. You know, um, so of course you have situations where things can be much more hard, I mean, harder, and, and, and the reactions can be very homophobic and violent. But I wanted also to show something a bit more nuanced, you know, um, and, um, and homosexuality in, in, in these countries are, it, it's, it's not like a, a mind, it's, it's widespread, like, like in Europe, like everywhere. And now, of course, uh, there are things that are changing, and for the first time, um, uh, I think it was like two years ago, the, um, the issue of uh, uh, depenalization of homosexuality was, was actually brought into the public debate, you know. So the, the only fact that we can just talk about it on TV, on TV shows, in the, in the chamber, shows that 
in Tunisia, the situation is still very, you know, hard for uh, LGBT people, but there is a, a prospect for this to change. Contrary, I mean, uh, unlike other countries where things are, you know, harder and, and well behind, you know, in terms of uh, uh, mentality. But in Tunisia, I mean, there, there is this, um, uh, this uh, debate actually, people talk about, they don't say we don't have that in our country, you know, people admit that there is, this is a, this is a, a reality. And that is, um, is something that it should be, that should be noted. And, uh, and that's why I, I try to portray this situation like, like that, you know, trying to show that it's also part of the order, ordinary life. And it's not something that needs to be like, okay, we don't need like a, a storyline that, you know, show um, um, Raouf being like threatened or uh, we don't really know about uh, Alpha's gender, um, sexuality. You know, we can assume. And, and I like the fact that in, in, in the movies and like the TV shows, we have the space for mystery to, to, to you know, we don't give, the the audience or the the keys or the clues we give things and you can project things and you can make your own interpretation and um and yeah i mean there is this question mark on on alpha sexuality maybe she's gay probably i think i thought of that when i was writing but i didn't want it to make an issue her issue is to leave and to break free to leave her country she might not know yet either she's young yeah Probably. <laughs> Wonderful. And you mentioned earlier that you are working on a second feature now. Could you tell us a little bit about your next project and what we can what we can look forward to from you? Well, it's you know it's um, it's still a mess, <laughs> but um, uh, actually I, I I I see it as a, a second chapter, but a chapter that had nothing to do, you know, with the first one. I mean, it will still have comedy inside. It will take place in France uh, with, a, with the Arab French community based in France. And uh, the thing that I would like to try in this film is to, uh, to, put, to push further the mix of genres mm. uh, and trying to, uh, to explore uh, much more the um, how do you call it? Sci-fi or uh, fantastic? Yeah, yeah. fantastic, yeah. Uh, oniric, you know, genre. Cool. <laughs> so it's uh, so that's why I said it's very very different. But um, I mean, when I read my my drafts and when I and I make my uh, the person who writes with me read, I mean we see a lot of um, bridges, you know, between the two films, even if it's not that obvious, but I guess uh, you, you can't help it. <laughs> Wonderful, well, we'll look forward to, to seeing that eventually. I'm excited now that you said sci-fi in it, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> um, and thank you so much for taking time on your vacation to talk with me and share your thoughts with our audiences. And Well, thank, thank you for your questions and thank you for inviting me. <laughs>